The United Nations was created on the back of the devastation that was left by World War II. In 1945, 50 countries came together in San Francisco to conclude the Charter of the United Nations. The UN has four main purposes. To keep peace throughout the world, to develop friendly relations among nations, to help nations work together to improve the lives of poor people, to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations to achieve these goals. In 2014, the UN has 193 members states and about 120,000 peacekeepers in 16 operations over four continents. Mobilizes about 12.5 billion US dollars in humanitarian aid following emergencies. Assists over 34 million refugees in their struggle to flee conflict, hardship and persecution. Vaccinates about 58% of children globally The UN operates through six bodies. The International Court of Justice is a judicial body to settle international legal disputes for the UN. It commenced its work in 1946 and is the only UN body that sits outside of New York. The court can hear cases brought by disputing parties or provide advisory opinions at the request of other UN bodies. There are 15 judges who are elected for 9-year terms. The Secretariat is the permanent staff of the UN who carry out the day-to-day -day work. At its head is the GA elected Secretary General, currently Ban Ki-moon. There are about 43,000 staff and 8 major offices. They deliver the services that are vital to the operations of the UN such as peacekeeping, humanitarian affairs, treaty and legal codification. The Economic and Social Council, also known as ECOSOC, consists of 54 members who are elected for three-year terms by the GA. This council has a broad mandate covering all economic social and environmental concerns. It is responsible for organizations that spend approximately 70% of the UN's budget. ECOSOC is very accommodating of the work of NGOs as observers with over 3,200 officially registered. The Security Council, also known as SC, is often seen as the enforcement mechanism of the UN. It is primarily responsible for the maintenance of peace and security and its resolutions bind all other members of the UN. It is allowed to authorize the use of force if necessary. There are five permanent members, France, United States of America, Great Britain, Russia and China and another 10 non-permanent members who are elected for two-year terms by the GA. The Trusteeship Council has been suspended since 1994. However, its role was to look after states that have been placed under the administration or trusteeship of the UN. This council was particularly important in the early years of the UN but since Palau achieved independence in 1994, has no longer been required. The members of this council are France, Great Britain, the United States of America, Russia and China. And finally, the General Assembly, also known as GA, this body includes all of the member states of the UN and is often seen as the most important because of its power to elect and appoint members to all other bodies. Its mandate also encompasses everything that any other UN body is responsible for. The work of the GA is predominantly done through six committees. 
The first committee, DISEC, deals with issues regarding disarmament and threats to peace and security. It places strong emphasis on disarmament as a means of creating global peace and stability. The second committee, ECOFIN, deals with economic and financial issues regarding trade, financial systems, debt sustainability, economic growth, development, and poverty eradication, among many other things. The third committee, SOCHIM, on social, cultural and humanitarian affairs, deals with a broad array of matters including the advancement of women, children, indigenous affairs, refugees, human rights and freedoms, self-determination and anti-discrimination. The fourth committee, SPECPOL, deals with decolonization and other special political issues including those regarding Israel-Palestine and issues that concern decolonized states such as peacekeeping, mine clearing and refugees. It also deals with other things that do not fit neatly into anything else like regulation of space and atomic radiation. The fifth committee deals with administrative and budgetary matters of the UN. It is often responsible for ensuring that the UN has enough money to conduct all of the programs and missions that it does. The sixth committee is responsible for legal affairs and is tasked with the development and revision of public international law in conjunction with the International Law Commission. In 2014, it was working on creating a universal legal definition for terrorism. In other words, the UN does some pretty serious things with a pretty big effect globally. Here is an overview of the whole UN structure. All of the information used in this video has been adapted from the United Nations website. Something's wrong, folks, in America. Something's really wrong. Something is destroying everything that we've ever held dear in this country. What is it? Well, if you've been listening to this show, many of you already know what it is. If you've just been listening to the show for a little while, you may have some idea, but you're not quite really sure yet what's going on. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it's all about religion. Whether you're religious or not doesn't make any difference. It's all about religion. Whether you believe in God or not, it doesn't make any difference. It's all about a big battle between good and evil. And most of it, i got to tell you, exists in the minds of men. Some of it's real. The question is, what's real? What's deception? What should we be paying any attention to? What is it that's driving us insane? Yes, something is wrong in America. The sound you hear is dripping blood. This is the start of Black Sunday. Today's newspapers, folks, are full of stories about the rampant rise in divorce rates, the increasing abuse of children by some parents, increases in the incidence of rape, pornography, being read by an increasing number of people, more crimes against property, demands for world government, urgings for national borders to fall, Christian churches being closed because they will not seek licensing by the state, etc., etc., etc. And I could go on and on and on and on and on. But why? Why are these things happening? 
Why are all of the legacies of the past, the family, national borders, the right to practice any chosen religion, the right to private property, among other things, under such an attack? Is it possible that there are actually people and organizations who really want to change the basic order of things? Well, my regular listeners know the answer to that. Clues to the answers to these questions, folks, can be gleaned from some comments made by people and organizations that are talking about these wide-ranging changes in the nature of our lifestyle. An Associated Press Dispatch on July the 26th, 1968, reported this, quote, New York Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller says as president he would work toward international creation of a new world order, unquote. And you thought George Bush coined that phrase? Surprise, surprise. On January the 30th, 1976, a new document called the Declaration of Interdependence was introduced to the American people and it was signed by 124 traitors. 32 senators and 92 representatives, altogether 124 traitors in Washington, D.C., and it read in part, quote, Two centuries ago, our forefathers brought forth a new nation. Now we must join with others to bring forth a new world order, unquote. And you thought George Bush coined that phrase. Surprise, surprise. Another individual who has commented is Henry Kissinger, probably the greatest traitor this nation has ever known, former Secretary of State. According to the Seattle Post Intelligence of April 18, 1975, Mr. Kissinger said, quote, Our nation is uniquely endowed to play a creative and decisive role in the new order which is taking form around us, unquote. George Bush gave the commencement address at Texas A&M University on May 12, 1989. And he used similar words as well. His speech was on the subject of Soviet-American relations, and he was quoted as saying in part, quote, Ultimately, our objective is to welcome the Soviet Union back into the world order. Perhaps the world order of the future will truly be a family of nations, unquote. Historian Walter Mills maintained that prior to World War I, Colonel Edward Mandel House, the major advisor to Woodrow Wilson, the president at the time, had a hidden motive for involving America in the war. The historian wrote this, quote, The colonel's sole justification for preparing such a batch of blood for his countrymen was his hope of establishing a new world order of peace and security, unquote. You see how these people fool themselves? <laughs> they always say that the end is peace and security, a world utopia, but to get it, they spill more blood than ever has been spilled in history each time they try to bring about their utopia. The blood runs in the streets. They're liars. They're hypocrites. They're manipulators, deceivers. They're the worshipers of Lucifer. Adolf Hitler, a socialist and the head of the German government prior to and during the nation's involvement in World War II, is quoted as saying this, quote, National Socialism will use its own revolution for the establishing of a new world order, unquote. Adolf Hitler was a socialist. Nazi means National Socialism. Hitler confided to Hermann Roshning, the president of the Danzig Senate, quote, National Socialism is more than a religion. It is the will to create Superman, unquote. And what is the number of the man? Six, six, six. You see, in the New World Order, only one man will be allowed to live. The new man, the illumined man, and the number of that man is six, six, six. You will see that number increasingly all around you. You will also begin to see pyramids increasingly all around you, and the eye in the pyramid, and the eye alone. And you will see circles with a dot in the center. And you will see obelisks appearing all over the place. And these are not the only signs. There are many, many, many more. They're the signs of the religion of mystery Babylon. Hitler added this thought, quote, Well, yes, we are barbarians, and barbarians we wish to remain. It does us honor. It is we who will rejuvenate the world, 
The present world is near its end. Our only task is to sack it, unquote. Another book on his background quoted his comments that his Nazi party had a hidden purpose, one that was not perceived by the world at large. Mr. Hitler was quoted as saying this, He who has seen in National Socialism only a political movement has seen nothing, for it is a religion. The humanist religion issued a manifesto in 1933 stating its beliefs about the world in general. It took the following position about the need for the wealthy governments to share their wealth with the less fortunate nations. It is the moral obligation of the developed nations to provide, through an international authority, economic assistance to the developed nations. Now that is a lie, folks. It means that it's okay for some of us to lay back and do nothing and reap the rewards of the labor of others. That's socialism. That's what it's all about. Communism, socialism, it's the same. And these people, the worshippers of Mystery Babylon, are the original communists. They are international socialism. They invented it. It is their creation. It is their dream of a world utopia. A one-world totalitarian socialist government. The April 1974 issue of Foreign Affairs, the quarterly periodical issued by the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, had an article in it by Richard N. Gardner, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations in the Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy administrations, and he stated this, quote, We are likely to do better by building our house of world order from bottom up rather than from the top down. An end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, is likely to get us to world order faster than the old-fashioned assault, unquote. Even the Communist Party is voicing similar thoughts. The People's Daily World for Thursday, March 9, 1989, contained an article written by Angela Davis. You remember her? Those familiar with Miss Davis will remember that she was the vice presidential candidate for the Communist Party a few years ago. She currently is a member of the National Committee of the Communist Party of the United States, and she is quoted in the paper as saying, quote, One underlying effect of anti-communism in this respect is to encourage a certain hesitancy to embrace solutions which call for deep structural socio-economic transformation, unquote. Another communist, Alexei Kovilov, spoke at an evening meeting held at Windstar, Colorado, in August 1985, and he gave the participants in attendance a surprise presentation. He spoke about the 12th World Festival of Youth and Students held in Moscow a few months prior to his lecture. He said, quote, There were three programs. The first was political and dealt with the various issues of peace and disarmament. The second was dedicated to environmental issues and to the new international economic order, unquote. The alleged need for a change in the basic way things are done is consistent with the teachings of the father of communism, Karl Marx. He's not really the father of communism, but it's a, it's a name that's been tagged onto him. You see, he was just a hack writer hired by the mystery religion of Babylon to write the Communist Manifesto. It was not his idea, but he's reaped the benefits of it, if you can call them benefits. But he co-authored the Communist Manifesto with Frederick Engels, another hack writer, in 1848. Mr. Marx wrote that the communists, quote, openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions, unquote. Nesta Webster, a writer on the subject of conspiratorial organizations in the past, wrote this in her book entitled Secret Societies, quote, the revolution desired by the leaders of world revolution is a moral and spiritual revolution, an anarchy of ideas by which all standards set up throughout 19 centuries shall be reversed, all honored traditions trampled underfoot, and above all, above all, the Christian ideal finally obliterated." Unquote. Some of the Catholic popes in the past have commented on the major changes coming in the future. One such pope was Pope Pius XI, who wrote the following in 1937. Communism has behind it occult forces for which a long time have been working for the overthrow of the Christian social order, unquote. One of the popes who preceded him, Pope Pius XI, or excuse me, Pope Pius IX, 
wrote this in November 1846 about the changes that he saw in the future. Quote, that infamous doctrine of so-called communism is absolutely contrary to the natural law itself, and if once adopted, would utterly destroy the rights, property, and possessions of all men, and even society itself, unquote. Now, don't get all worked up about what the Pope says, because they have succeeded now with this Pope in putting one of their own upon the throne of the Vatican. It had long been their dream, and now... It is true. And the bans have been lifted against Catholics joining secret societies. Many of the hierarchy of the Vatican belong to the secret societies, the Freemasons, Propaganda II, etc., etc., etc. You will find an obelisk, <laughs> the symbol of the phallus, the penis of Osiris, in the Vatican courtyard. If you don't believe me, go look. Another individual who wrote about the future was Dr. Jose Arguelles of an organization known as the Planet Arc Network. Dr. Arguelles wrote, quote, also implicit in all these events is a call for another way of life, another way of doing things, a redistribution of global wealth, in short, a new world order, unquote. Now, just what the future society was that these people are talking about was described in a brief manner by Marilyn Ferguson in her book entitled The Aquarian Conspiracy, and she wrote this, quote, The new world is the old, transformed, unquote. Another clue about what is in store for the future world was offered by Dr. James H. Billington, who received his doctorate as a Rhodes, 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 Rhodes scholar, where have you heard that before? You have a Rhodes Scholar sitting in the Oval Office right now. Received his doctorate as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University and has taught at Harvard and Princeton Universities. He wrote this in his book entitled Fire in the Minds of Men. Quote, This book seeks to trace the origins of a faith, perhaps the faith of our time. What is new is the belief that a perfect secular order will emerge from the forcible overthrow of traditional authority, unquote. You hear that? They believe a perfect secular order will emerge. Nothing perfect will ever emerge from the minds of imperfect men, and no men will ever be ruled by other imperfect men in a, any kind of a perfect utopian order, secular or otherwise. That is why we must be eternally vigilant, eternally vigilant, that these future changes would involve force and slavery was confirmed by B.F. Skinner, chairman of the psychology department at Harvard University. In his book entitled Beyond Freedom and Dignity, Dr. Skinner has been called the most influential of living American psychologists by Time magazine. So the world should listen to the professor when he speaks. The magazine told the reader what the message of Professor Skinner's book was. Quote, We can no longer afford freedom, and so it must be replaced with control over man, his conduct, and his culture. Unquote. Not long ago in the Los Angeles Times, there was an article called Ten Forecasts for the Coming Decade. One of these was chemical or electronic implants to control individual behavior on a 24-hour basis. Another student of these changes is Alvin Toffler, who wrote this in his book entitled The Third Wave. And you should read everything that he's written, by the way, because what he's writing is what is coming. Quote, a new civilization is emerging in our lives. This new civilization brings with it new family styles, changed ways of working, loving and living, a new economy, new political conflicts, and beyond all this, an altered consciousness as well. The dawn of this new civilization is the single most explosive fact of our lifetimes, unquote. Another scientist involved in commenting upon the future changes was Dr. Carl Sagan, and he's observed this, quote, It's clear that sometime, relatively soon in terms of the lifetime of the human species, people will identify with the entire planet and the species, unquote. Now the reason, folks, why these changes are necessary was explained by Manly P. Hall, perhaps the world's leading authority on esoteric words and language. He was a 33rd degree Freemason. He wrote in his book entitled Lectures on Ancient Philosophy, quote, 
The time has not yet arrived when the average man is strong enough or wise enough to rule himself, unquote. And he explained who he considered worthy enough to rule those on the world considered by the experts to be incapable of governing themselves. He wrote this, quote, Never will peace reign upon the earth until we are ruled by the fifth. And who is the fifth? <laughs> Why, them, of course. The illumined, the priest of the mystery religion of Babylon. Mr. Hall even indicated that these changes would occur soon. He wrote this comment in his book previously cited, quote, 100 years ago, meaning in 1884, folks, it was predicted that within a few centuries men would revert to the gods of Plato and Aristotle. We may all look forward with eager anticipation to that nobler day when the gods of philosophy once more shall rule the world." Unquote. Aldous Huxley, in his book called Brave New World, revisited, quotes a character called the Grand Inquisitor in one of Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky's parables as saying this, quote, In the end they, the people, will lay their freedom at our, the controller's feet, and say to us, Make us your slaves, but feed us." Unquote. The Tucson Citizen newspaper of November the 3rd, 1988, printed a photograph of a group of people involved in a march for literacy, and it clearly demonstrated that at least some people in America are now asking their government to make them their slaves. The picture showed a demonstrator carrying a picket sign that read, quote, Uncle Sam, we want you to support us. Unquote. Mr. Huxley gave us a date when we could expect these changes to occur. He wrote the following in his book written in 1958, quote, The 21st century will be the era of world controllers, unquote. And then he told us why these controllers would not fail, quote, The older dictators fell because they could never supply their subjects with enough bread, enough circuses, enough miracles and mysteries. Under a scientific dictatorship, education will really work with the result that most men and women will grow up to love their servitude and will never dream of revolution. There seems to be no good reason why a thoroughly scientific dictatorship should ever be overthrown." Unquote. Someone who might have given the world the date for the commencement of these predicted changes was Zbigniew Brzezinski, a Marxist, President Jimmy Carter's national security advisor during his four-year administration, and he wrote the following in his book entitled Between Two Ages, by the way, you should read every book that he's ever written, you will be angered. Quote, either 1976 or 1989, the 200th anniversary of the Constitution could serve as a suitable target date for culminating a national dialogue on the relevance of existing arrangements, the workings of the representative process, and the desirability of imitating the various European regionalization reforms and of streamlining the administrative structure, unquote. And it did begin exactly when he said it would. So the people of the world can now determine what those changes are that those in the positions of implementing changes have in store for them. In summary, folks, these changes are the old world is coming to an end. It will be replaced with a new way of doing things. The new world will be called the New World Order. This new structuring will redistribute property from the have nations and will give it to the have not nations. The New World Order will include changes in the family, the workplace, religion. The United States will play a major role in bringing it to the world. World wars have been fought to further its aims. Adolf Hitler, the Nazi socialist, supported the goal of the planners. The majority of the people will not readily accept the New World Order, but will be deceived into accepting it by two strategies. One, those in favor of the changes will have become seated in the very thrones of power, generally without the public realizing that fact, and this has already occurred. Two, the Old World Order will be destroyed piece by piece by a series of planned nibbles at the established format. The Communist Party is actively supporting the changes to the New World Order. The basic tenets of Christianity, which were the base for the Old World Order, will have to be eliminated. If the slower methodical techniques of change do not function, violence will be introduced and controlled by the planners, including possibly a World War III using atomic weapons. The people of the world will give up their freedom to the controllers because there will be a planned famine or some other serious occurrence, such as a depression or war. The change to the New World Order is coming shortly, folks, and it has already begun. However, if that is not 
the case, it will be introduced one step at a time so that the entire structure will be in place by the year 1999. We've got to take a short break. Don't go away. Well, something is indeed wrong in America. And many sense that changes in this nation's lifestyle are occurring. Most of us know full well that these changes are taking place. The newspapers are saturated with articles reporting the activities of those increased governmental spending for a variety of unconstitutional purposes. Organizations supporting a globalism concept urge the world to adopt a one-world government. Psychologists preaching the destruction of the family unit and recommending that the society rear the nation's children. Governments closing private schools and nations forming regional governments under which national borders are scheduled to disappear. And still the sheeple think that all of this is happening by accident. And any concept that it is being brought about by a carefully orchestrated plan is the product of crazy conspiratorialists. Mm hmm Since these changes appear to be part of the new philosophy known as the New World Order, anyone desiring to know the future has to become familiar with this new phrase and what it portends for the world of tomorrow, and you will quickly see that it is the result of a well-thought-out, well-conceived, and well-orchestrated plan. Indeed, it is called the Great Work. As an indication that major changes are coming in tomorrow's world, one of the current trends mentioned is the call for a one-world government. And one of those supporting this leap forward is Norman Cousins, president of the World Federalist Society, and he's on record as saying this, quote, World government is coming. In fact, it is inevitable. No arguments for it or against it can change that fact, unquote. And I say that is a lie. 240 million Americans standing up in concert with each other, holding a rifle in their hands, can stop it instantly in its tracks. And that's the truth of why we were given the second article in amendment to the Constitution. It has nothing to do with hunting or preserving your private property. It has to do with preserving our freedom. The goal of a one-world government, folks, is not a new thought. One of the earliest formal organizations that supported the concept of that goal was the Illuminati, founded on May 1st, 1776 by Adam Weishaupt, a Jesuit priest, a professor at Ingolstadt University, a Jesuit university, a teacher of canon law. Professor Weishaupt was quoted as saying this, quote, it is necessary to establish a universal regime and empire over the whole world, unquote. Now, let me tell you the truth about the Illuminati. Adam Weishaupt did not establish the Illuminati, nor did the Illuminati die with Adam Weishaupt. Make sure you understand that. A more modern organization that supports the coming changes is the Masonic Order called simply the Freemasons, or for short, the Masons has nothing to do with bricklayers, folks. The term originally comes from the French, free maison, which literally means the sons of light. This worldwide fraternity has members in America, as will be discussed, and they too support a call for a one-world government. One who has written about this secret organization is Paul Fisher, and he says this about them in his book entitled Behind the Lodge Door, quote, Masonry will eventually rule the world, unquote. <laughs> Benevolent, fraternal organization. Albert Pike, and you're going to hear an awful lot about Albert Pike during this series. The sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry here in the United States from 1850 to 1891. The man who founded the Ku Klux Klan and B'nai B'rith. Wrote a book entitled Morals and Dogma. And when and if you can find that book, don't pass it up, buy it, and read it. Mr. Pike has been praised by his fellow Masons as a member almost without parallel in the history of the Masonic Order. He was a great friend of Giuseppe Massini, the ruler of the European branch of the Illuminati. Carl Cloudy himself, a Masonic writer of great esteem, wrote this about Pike. Quote, Albert Pike, one of the greatest geniuses Freemasonry has ever known. He was a mystic, a symbolist 
a teacher of the hidden truths of Freemasonry, unquote. So the outsider can know that whenever Mr. Pike speaks, he speaks with authority and knowledge. He is perhaps the greatest Masonic writer of all time, and I would uh, add next to Manly P. Hall. His book is given to each Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction Freemason who is asked to read it. There seems to be a difference of opinion as to whether or not this book is still required reading for each Scottish Rite Mason. As we were told that it was given to each Scottish Rite Mason in Tucson, other Masons say that that is not true. But you have to remember they're sworn not to reveal the secrets of the Lodge, and therefore you can never trust them to tell you the truth no matter what they're telling you. But in this book, Morals and Dogma, Pike informs the new Mason about the moral teachings of the Masonic Lodge. He instructs the Masonic reader that the order will eventually be asked to rule the entire globe, and he wrote this, quote, The world will soon come to us for its sovereigns and pontiffs. We shall constitute the equilibrium of the universe and be rulers over the masters of the world, unquote. He wrote this supportive statement in a book entitled Legenda, quote, And thus the warfare against the powers of evil that crushed the order of the temple goes steadily on, and freedom marches ever onward toward the conquest of the world, unquote. Reference to the order of the temple is reference to the Knights Templars who were destroyed in concert by King Philip of France and Pope Clement V, and the powers of evil referred to in this paragraph is the Christian church, the Christian religion, Christianity as a whole. Let me read it to you again, just in case you weren't paying attention. Quote, And thus the warfare against the powers of evil that crushed the order of the temple goes steadily on, and freedom marches ever onward toward the conquest of the world. Unquote. The order of the temple Mr. Pike was writing about was the Knights Templar, which was, according to him, quote, devoted to the cause of opposition to the tiara, the Pope's triple crown, and the crown of kings, unquote. Well, then is it any wonder that the king of France and the Pope crushed the Templars in France? So that is the only place that they were truly crushed. Mr. Pike said that the Catholic Church was a power of evil because it had crushed the Templars, even though he admitted that they were devoted to opposition to the Church and its leader, the Pope. But the major point of that quote is that these forces of opposition, presumably meaning the Masons, are marching onward toward the conquest of the world. Mr. Pike repeated his devotion to the conquest of the world with this comment at the end of his book entitled Morals and Dogma, quote, such, my brother, is the true word of a master mason, such the true royal secret which makes possible and shall at length make real the holy empire of true Masonic brotherhood, unquote. Now, all of you master masons out there who've been writing me letters, don't write to me anymore. You are my enemies, and if I can, I will destroy you. Don't write to me and profess your innocence, for your own have proclaimed your guilt. And if you are truly innocent, then you're just a foolish dupe, and you better get out while you can. The major worldwide movement that champions a one-world government, folks, under a religious leader is a new phenomenon occurring worldwide called the New Age Movement, a creation of Freemasonry. The newspaper put out by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry is called The New Age. Tex Mars, a researcher into this new religion, has written two books on the subject. Both of these books are excellent primers for those who wish to know more about the beliefs of this religion. The two books are entitled Dark Secrets of the New Age and Mystery Mark of the New Age. And he has written, quote, The New Age movement has undeniably taken on the definite form of a religion, of course, because it is Mystery Babylon. He goes on to say, complete with an agreed-upon body of doctrine, printed scripture, a pattern of worship and ritual, a functioning group of ministers and lay leaders, unquote. Another writer who has written two books on the New Age religion is Constance Cumbie. Her two books are called The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow and A Planned Deception. She has written this, quote, The New Age movement is a religion, complete with its own Bibles, prayers, and mantras. Vatican City, Jerusalem equivalents, priests and gurus, born-again experiences, they call it rebirthing, 
spiritual laws and commandments, psychics and prophets, and nearly every other indicia of a religion, unquote. The new religion has a series of leaders. One is a woman named Alice Bailey, a prolific writer on the subject of the New Age. She was the founder of an organization called the Arcane School, one of the major Lucis Trust divisions. The Lucis Trust was a major publisher of books supporting the religion and published a newsletter or newspaper called Lucifer. In her book entitled The Externalization of the Hierarchy, she told her readers who the organizations were that were going to bring the New Age religion to the world, and she identified them as being, quote, the three main channels through which the preparation for the New Age is going on might be regarded as the church, the Masonic fraternity, and the educational field. And folks, that is exactly who is bringing it to realization. The main thrust of this program is going to be to examine only one of the three organizations mentioned by Alice Bailey, that being the Masonic Fraternity. There are numerous works by other writers, lecturers, researchers, exposing the involvement of the church in the educational field in the New Age movement and in the New World Order. So I'm not going to attempt to duplicate those efforts. However, only a few are aware of the involvement of the Freemasons, and that is why I have chosen to concentrate on that organization, Mystery Babylon. And the reason I'm concentrating on that organization is because it is their members who have infiltrated the church and the educational field who control those other two organizations. So really there's only one organization that needs to be dealt with, and that is Freemasonry. Another major writer on the New Age movement is Benjamin Krim, and he admitted in his book entitled The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom that, quote, the new religion will manifest, for instance, through organizations like Masonry. In Freemasonry is embedded the core of the secret of the occult mysteries, unquote. So, Masonry conceals a great mystery inside its temples, one that is connected somehow to the New Age movement. The Masons admit in some of their writings that they too are anticipating a new age, a series of major changes. Henry Clausen, the past sovereign grand commander, the equivalent of their president of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, has been quoted as saying this, quote, We look towards a transforming into a new age using, however, the insight and wisdom of the ancient mystics, unquote. The Masons claim that the things that they believe in are as old as the ancient civilizations. They also claim that these mystics, the ancient philosophers, had the wisdom of all ages and that somehow this knowledge has become lost through the centuries. Humanity today does not possess this knowledge, but it has become the task of the Masons and other truth seekers who turn out in every case of investigation to be liars and deceivers and manipulators to rediscover these principles for the benefit of all mankind. Those possessing this knowledge will correct the world's current problems. Some of the Masons also claim to have identified the cause of these problems. One of the most prolific writers on the subject of this lost truth, as I have mentioned earlier, is Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree Mason. For those unfamiliar with the Masonic degrees, all Masons in America start through what is called the Blue Lodge, consisting of only three degrees. A master Mason is of the third degree and really knows nothing, even though he thinks that he has been illumined, and I get letters from them all the time. I'm a master Mason, and I never heard of any of the stuff that you're talking about. <laughs> oh, boy. I, it, it amazes me, folks. It just absolutely amazes me that people are so stupid. Drives me wild. The initiate into the Blue Lodge goes through three separate and different initiation ceremonies, one for each degree. After completing these ceremonies, he may stay where he is or choose to affili affiliate himself with either the York Rite, which has 13 degrees, or the Scottish Rite, which has 32, and then the Meritorious 33rd. The latter is divided into two separate jurisdictions, the Southern and the Northern. And these are based primarily on state borders, and whether one joins one or the other depends on where the initiate lives. The two Scottish Rites have an additional 29 degrees, 
making for a total of 32. There is one more degree called the 33rd degree, which is honorary, and only a few are invited into that degree and to even be considered. They must perform some major work toward the completion of the great work, which is the plan to bring about. The utopia on earth, the socialist dream. York Wright has a total of nine degrees. However, since little has been revealed about this order, we will concentrate on only the Scottish Rite, and in particular the southern jurisdiction. Well, I've since discovered that the York Rite has a total of 13 degrees, folks, not just nine. Mr. Hall has written a book entitled Lectures on Ancient Philosophy, in which he talks a great deal about the Masonic fraternity. And this is his comment about the coming changes. Quote, a new day is dawning for Freemasonry from the insufficiency of theology and the hopelessness of materialism. Men are turning to seek the God of philosophy. Unquote. Notice that Mr. Hall has said that current theology, obviously current religion, has proven insufficient. Also, he feels that materialism, meaning the right to private property, is also a failure. But more importantly, he points out that this new God of the Freemasons is somehow different from the God of the Jews and Christians, as will be illustrated later. Some of the Masons believe that the God of the Bible is a God of evil. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, perhaps the founder of the current New Age movement, has also determined that the Masons are somehow supportive of her religious views. She wrote this in her book entitled, The Secret Doctrine. Quote, At the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries, many Freemasons traveled to Tibet, where they were initiated into the esoteric, defined as intended for or understood by only a chosen few as an inner group of disciples or initiates by an esoteric order of the masters of wisdom." Unquote. It should be expected that she would support the Masonic fraternity. In 1875, she founded an organization called the Theosophical Society, basically dedicated to teaching the world about her new secret religion. One of the earliest members of that organization was Albert Pike, later to become the sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Albert Pike, who later became a 33rd degree Mason, the highest degree attainable also saw that there were some significant changes coming and that he was supportive of those changes. He wrote the following in his book entitled Morals and Dogma. Quote, we can look on all the evils of the world and see that it is only the hour before sunrise and that the light is coming, unquote. The conquest of the world. Mr. Pike repeated his devotion to the conquest of the world with this comment at the end of his book entitled Morals and Dogma, quote, Such, my brother, is the true word of a master mason, such the true royal secret which makes possible and shall at length make real the holy empire of true Masonic brotherhood, unquote. Now, all of you master masons out there who've been writing me letters, don't write to me anymore. You are my enemies. And if I can, I will destroy you. Don't write to me and profess your innocence, for your own have proclaimed your guilt. And if you are truly innocent, then you're just a foolish dupe, and you better get out while you can. The major worldwide movement that champions a one-world government, folks, under a religious leader is a new phenomenon occurring worldwide called the New Age Movement, a creation of Freemasonry. The newspaper put out by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry is called The New Age. Tex Mars, a researcher into this new religion, has written two books on the subject. Both of these books are excellent primers for those who wish to know more about the beliefs of this religion. The two books are entitled Dark Secrets of the New Age and Mystery Mark of the New Age, and he has written, quote, The New Age movement has undeniably taken on the definite form of a religion, of course, because it is mystery Babylon. He goes on to say, complete with an agreed upon body of doctrine, printed scripture, a pattern of worship and ritual, a functioning group of ministers and lay leaders, unquote. Another writer who has written two books on the New Age religion is Constance Cumby. Her two books are called The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow and A Planned Deception. She has written this, quote, the New Age movement is a religion complete with its own Bibles, prayers, and mantras. Vatican City, Jerusalem equivalents, priests and gurus, born-again experiences, they call it rebirthing, 
spiritual laws and commandments, psychics and prophets, and nearly every other indicia of a religion, unquote. The new religion has a series of leaders. One is a woman named Alice Bailey, a prolific writer on the subject of the New Age. She was the founder of an organization called the Arcane School, one of the major Lucis Trust divisions. The Lucis Trust was a major publisher of books supporting the religion and published a newsletter or newspaper called Lucifer. In her book entitled The Externalization of the Hierarchy, she told her readers who the organizations were that were going to bring the New Age religion to the world, and she identified them as being, quote, the three main channels through which the preparation for the New Age is going on might be regarded as the church, the Masonic fraternity, and the educational field. And folks, that is exactly who is bringing it to realization. The main thrust of this program is going to be to examine only one of the three organizations mentioned by Alice Bailey, that being the Masonic Fraternity. There are numerous works by other writers, lecturers, researchers, exposing the involvement of the church in the educational field in the New Age movement and in the New World Order. So I'm not going to attempt to duplicate those efforts. However, only a few are aware of the involvement of the Freemasons, and that is why I have chosen to concentrate on that organization, Mystery Babylon. And the reason I'm concentrating on that organization is because it is their members who have infiltrated the church and the educational field who control those other two organizations. So really there's only one organization that needs to be dealt with, and that is Freemasonry. Another major writer on the New Age movement is Benjamin Krim, and he admitted in his book entitled The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom that, quote, the new religion will manifest, for instance, through organizations like Masonry. In Freemasonry is embedded the core of the secret of the occult mysteries, unquote. So, Masonry conceals a great mystery inside its temples, one that is connected somehow to the New Age movement. The Masons admit in some of their writings that they too are anticipating a new age, a series of major changes. Henry Clausen, the past sovereign grand commander, the equivalent of their president of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, has been quoted as saying this, quote, we look towards a transforming into a new age using, however, the insight and wisdom of the ancient mystics, unquote. The Masons claim that the things that they believe in are as old as the ancient civilizations. They also claim that these mystics, the ancient philosophers, had the wisdom of all ages and that somehow this knowledge has become lost through the centuries. Humanity today does not possess this knowledge, but it has become the task of the Masons and other truth seekers who turn out in every case of investigation to be liars and deceivers and manipulators, to rediscover these principles for the benefit of all mankind. Those possessing this knowledge will correct the world's current problems. Some of the Masons also claim to have identified the cause of these problems. One of the most prolific writers on the subject of this lost truth, as I have mentioned earlier, is Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree Mason. For those unfamiliar with the Masonic degrees, all Masons in America start through what is called the Blue Lodge, consisting of only three degrees. A Master Mason is of the third degree and really knows nothing, even though he thinks that he has been illumined, and I get letters from them all the time. I'm a Master Mason, and I never heard of any of the stuff that you're talking about. <laughs> oh, boy. I, it, it amazes me, folks. It just absolutely amazes me that people are so Stupid drives me wild. The initiate into the Blue Lodge goes through three separate and different initiation ceremonies, one for each degree. After completing these ceremonies, he may stay where he is or choose to affiliate himself with either the York Rite, which has 13 degrees, or the Scottish Rite, which has 32, and then the Meritorious 33rd. The latter is divided into two separate jurisdictions, the Southern and the Northern. And these are based primarily on state borders, and whether one joins one or the other depends on where the initiate lives. 
The two Scottish rites have an additional 29 degrees, making for a total of 32. There is one more degree called the 33rd degree, which is honorary, and only a few are invited into that degree, and to even be considered, they must perform some major work toward the completion of the great work, which is the plan to bring about. The utopia on earth, the socialist dream. York Rite has a total of nine degrees. However, since little has been revealed about this order, we will concentrate on only the Scottish Rite, and in particular the southern jurisdiction. Well, I've since discovered that the York Rite has a total of 13 degrees, folks, not just nine. Mr. Hall has written a book entitled Lectures on Ancient Philosophy, in which he talks a great deal about the Masonic fraternity. And this is his comment about the coming changes. Quote, a new day is dawning for Freemasonry from the insufficiency of theology and the hopelessness of materialism. Men are turning to seek the God of philosophy. Unquote. Notice that Mr. Hall has said that current theology, obviously current religion, has proven insufficient. Also, he feels that materialism, meaning the right to private property, is also a failure. But more importantly, he points out that this new God of the Freemasons is somehow different from the God of the Jews and Christians, as will be illustrated later. Some of the Masons believe that the God of the Bible is a God of evil. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, perhaps the founder of the current New Age movement, has also determined that the Masons are somehow supportive of her religious views. She wrote this in her book entitled, The Secret Doctrine. Quote, At the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries, many Freemasons traveled to Tibet, where they were initiated into the esoteric, defined as intended for or understood by only a chosen few as an inner group of disciples or initiates, by an esoteric order of the masters of wisdom. Unquote. It should be expected that she would support the Masonic fraternity. In 1875, she founded an organization called the Theosophical Society, basically dedicated to teaching the world about her new secret religion. One of the earliest members of that organization was Albert Pike, later to become the sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Albert Pike, who later became a 33rd degree Mason, the highest degree attainable, also saw that there were some significant changes coming and that he was supportive of those changes. He wrote the following in his book entitled Morals and Dogma. Quote, We can look on all the evils of the world and see that it is only the hour before sunrise and the evil that, that his fellow Mason Albert Pike saw are connected to current religion and that which is coming is somehow different from these religious views. Mr. Hall, who is mentioned previously as another 33rd degree Mason, also wrote that a new day was coming and that it was not too far into the future. Quote, a new light is breaking in the east. The significance of the location the east, I have already pointed out. It is the point where the sun rises. A more glorious day is at hand. The rule of the philosophic elect, the dream of the ages, will yet be realized and is not too far distant. Unquote. So, Mr. Hall is also expecting that these changes are about to occur in the not-too-distant future. Someone who attempted to zero in on when these changes were expected to occur was Alice Bailey, previously mentioned. She wrote about when she thought the New Age would arrive. Quote, Eventually, there will appear the Church Universal and its definite outlines will appear towards the close of this century, unquote. And you have already seen the emergence of the Universalist since she wrote early in the 20th century, we can see that she was predicting the eventual arrival of the New Age sometime around the 1990s. This estimate of that date is not too far wrong, as will be demonstrated later in this series of programs. Whatever is coming in the future, some New Agers have told us that they expect that it will last for a long time. One such writer is Ruth Montgomery, who wrote that she saw that the new religion would rule the earth for a thousand years. She wrote the following in her book entitled Herald for the New Age. Quote, the New Age, the millennium, a millennium is a period of one thousand years, will see an end to that strife at least for a thousand years, unquote. Now just what the New Age religion that will last for at least one thousand years on earth, what is it? 
One who attempted to answer that question was Constance Cumby in her book entitled The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. She wrote that these were the basic tenets of the new religion. Listen closely. The plan for the future includes the installation of a new world messiah, the implementation of a new world government and new world religion under Maitreya, an individual who will be examined later in this series of programs. Two, a universal credit card system will be implemented as a cashless society. Three, a world food authority will control all of the world's food supply. Four, a universal tax. Five, a universal draft. And six, they intend on utterly rooting out people who believe the Bible and worship God and to completely stamp out Christianity from the face of this earth. As was discussed prior to this summary, certain people have indicated that they see the Catholic Church as an enemy. Here, Mrs. Cumby says that they see not only Catholicism as the enemy, they also see all of Christianity as an enemy. Whatever the New Agers believe in, folks, it appears to be growing in popularity. Bantam Books, one of this nation's leading publishing houses, has reported that the sales of their New Age titles has increased tenfold in the past decade. Time Magazine reports that the number of New Age bookstores has doubled in the past five years to a total of about 2,500 according to an article in Forbes magazine, quote, publishers estimate that total sales of New Age titles today are at least $100 million at retail, unquote. So whatever they believe in, many believe in it. But perhaps the most insightful comment about the nature of what the New Age religion believe in and who they worship as their god was written by Mrs. Cumby in her book entitled The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. She wrote that they had... Quote, the intent of bringing about a new world order, an order that writes God out of the picture and deifies Lucifer, unquote. So if Mrs. Cumby and the other writers on the subject are right, the New Age movement needs to be studied in some depth. We know that the goal of Freemasonry, at least that which is stated, is to bring about the new man, the illumined man, and the number of the men is 666. 